Hi guys, my name is Richard. You're watching The Plain Bagel. I wasn't originally going to do a video on Bitcoin. You know, I want this channel to be a neutral source of information and that will allow people to come to their own conclusions about specific investments. But I've had a lot of friends ask me about Bitcoin and quite frankly, it's getting crazy out there. Uh, there's kind of this fanaticism around Bitcoin that, you know, revolves around this idea that Bitcoin's going to change the way we do transactions and it's going to be the currency of the future. And that fanaticism is kind of based on both the fact that people have made a lot of money and this libertarian uh, kind of rev revolution mindset that this is a chance to really separate from the big banks and the banking system and do it our way kind of thing. And unfortunately, companies are taking advantage of that. I mean, just to read a few headlines, in October, Long Island Ice T Corp, after facing the risk of being delisted from the NASDAQ for its market value falling below $35 million, changed its name to Long Blockchain Corp. The stock almost tripled in price in one day. In December, Israel's Natural Resource Holding Limited changed from a mineral mining company to a Bitcoin mining company. Its stock increased 159%. In my personal favorite, female pop group Kasutsuka Shoujo, virtual currency girls in English, performs in Tokyo on Friday. The new idol band kicked off their stage event to educate the public about cryptocurrencies, wearing cryptocurrency themed masks. You know, I don't know about you, but nothing says finance to me more than maid costumes and Lucha Libre masks. I mean, imagine if people were like this about a commodity like gold or, or oil, like it, it would seem kind of bizarre in a different context. So I want to make this video to kind of dispel some of the myths around Bitcoin and kind of to challenge some of the arguments for Bitcoin. Because I think some of the arguments are irrational. And I'm sure if you own Bitcoin, some of the points I make may upset you or you may feel challenged by them, but just hear me out because the whole point of this video is not to make people feel bad for buying Bitcoin. It's not to, you know, challenge people's intelligence or rationality even, but just to raise these concerns because there are people out there who are ignoring these things. If by the end of this video, you, you hear what I say and you don't agree with me or you, you don't believe in the arguments I've made, that's fine, but just hear me out. So let's start this whole thing by establishing some common ground that I think most of us can agree on. Uh, the first thing being that Bitcoin is high risk. You know, whether you measure risk by volatility or how much the price changes or risk based on, you know, qualitative things like, like regulatory risk and things like that, um, Bitcoin is high risk. And the reason why I highlight this is because some people will tell you that Bitcoin is the future of currency and all these absolute statements and there's no absolutes in investments. You know, only, only a Sith deals in absolutes. The second thing that I think we can agree on is that Bitcoin and blockchain are separable. So for people who don't understand blockchain, this is a bit of an oversimplification, but there's essentially three kind of main components. There's the ledger, which is, you know, if you do a transaction, the record of that transaction, and this ledger is shared between peers. There's this thing called the protocol, which is how this ledger is simultaneously up updated between each of the peers. And finally, there's this token, which in this case is Bitcoin. And this token is provided to these peers who support this network as kind of a reward for doing so. With Bitcoin, they're called miners, but more or less the, the algorithms they're running are supporting the system and allowing transactions to occur on blockchain. Uh, but blockchain is separable from Bitcoin. Bitcoin itself is just that token. It's this online currency, you know, you can think of it as like air miles or something like that. It's, it's a point system online that you can use to trade with other people for transactions. And Bitcoin uses blockchain, but blockchain is a methodology. You can think of it as being like a computer and Bitcoin is like a program. Just because a computer may have value doesn't mean that Bitcoin will have value. And there's no barriers to using blockchain. You know, the Canadian dollar or the US dollar tomorrow could apply blockchain to it. It's not exclusive to Bitcoin. The final kind of point of common ground I think that we should agree on is that Bitcoin or buying Bitcoin is speculating. The difference between speculating and investing is when you invest, you buy something that's going to pay you dividends. It's going to increase in value over time, increase in intrinsic value over time. And it, it's typically backed by something of value, something that, you know, if things go sour, there's a supporting value for that thing. Uh, Bitcoin doesn't have that. Bitcoin's not backed by anything. Some people argue that's backed by blockchain, but again, they're separable. So 
if you made that argument, if you applied blockchain to anything else, you're kind of arguing that that value is then added to that thing. At the end of the day, it's just a code on the computer. And that code only has value because other people say it does. Another way to look at it is to look at market value versus intrinsic value. Uh, market value being, you know, that price that people will pay for something, but intrinsic value being what it's actually worth. You can think of it as like when an Xbox is released, for example, like the Xbox One, um, it might have sold for $800 on day one, but a year from then, it's, you know, 50% cheaper. It's the same Xbox, but the market value has fallen more towards its intrinsic value or what it's actually worth. And when the two kind of diverge when you have this inflated demand. And that inflated demand is what the speculation is. This core demand, or the actual demand, is demand, in this case for Bitcoin, for, the, for its use as a currency. But this inflated demand comes from speculators or people who are simply buying it because they think it will increase further in price in the future. So now if we can agree on these common things, let's get into the more debatable stuff, which are the arguments for Bitcoin. First argument is that Bitcoin is decentralized, which means big institutions can't or won't control it. Um, this one I have some problems with because the banks will still influence the currency. Because if they have currency and if they have a loan business, they'll be able to influence the value of that currency through interest rates. If an interest rate increases, the currency becomes more valuable. And if it decreases, it becomes less valuable. So banks will still have a bit of control over the currency. The other thing is that governments clearly do have control over the use of currency. They might not have control over Bitcoin itself, but they can control who uses it. And that's a huge risk for people owning Bitcoin. And this raises a whole other issue in the fact that, you know, some governments I don't think will ever accept Bitcoin. I, I think of the American government and I find it hard to believe that they would accept something so unregulated um, and really so anonymous in that it can fund terrorist groups, it can fund the black market. So there's a strong argument for banning Bitcoin because there are these illegal activities that will benefit from it. Another argument is that Bitcoin is more convenient since it avoids a middleman. This one is kind of a pro and con approach. You know, a lot of people uh, love Bitcoin for cross-border transactions because it avoids, again, that middleman, those governments involved. But it's not necessarily more convenient than fiat currency. Bitcoin uses almost 4,000 times more electricity than a credit card transaction. And at some point, if the currency becomes widespread, that's gonna be a huge cost. And on top of that, the Bitcoin system can only support around seven transactions a second compared to Visa, Visa credit card, which can support 24,000 transactions a second. So the scalability might be an issue here. This is an argument that people love to reference. It makes sense that Bitcoin's price is going up because of limited supply. So currently there's around 16.5 million Bitcoin um, and there's this maximum set so that there can only ever be 21 million Bitcoins created. It is true that if supply is fixed and demand continually increases, that price will go up. It makes sense. But that opens a whole can of worms in terms of Bitcoin's use as a currency that almost leads to a fundamental flaw in its argument. If it's continually increasing and decreasing in value, that's very hard on the economy. And there's huge costs associated with inflation and on the other side, deflation. Even if we were to assume that the price will always increase, why would I ever spend a Bitcoin? You know, it's a Bitcoin today is gonna to be worth less than a Bitcoin tomorrow. So if I hold on to that Bitcoin, I'll have more money tomorrow. And it means that if I spend that Bitcoin, I'm taking a huge cost because not only am I spending the value today, I'm spending tomorrow's value of Bitcoin. It almost discourages spending in that sake. If, if you argue that the price will always increase. Um, fiat currency, whether intentional or not, has inflation. So it encourages people to buy today. But Bitcoin does the opposite. If, if you spend a Bitcoin, you're missing out on this return. I mean, at its highest point, Bitcoin was up over 2,000% on an annual basis. If you truly thought that that was gonna be repeated, you'd have to be crazy to spend it. And I know people say that you can't compare Bitcoin to fiat currency, but you have to. They're both currencies, they have the same purpose and the same output. Regardless of behind the scenes, you still compare them. When, when you research the energy sector, you compare oil companies to renewable energy 
like you know wind turbines sure they're different and you analyze them separately but at the end of the day you're still comparing the two side by side they have the same output for consumers so you do have to compare them to each other this is one of the craziest arguments I've seen. Uh, the Winklevoss twins, who are the famous you know, Facebook twins, uh, who are now internet entrepreneurs, uh, they've been quoted saying that Bitcoin is like gold or gold 2.0. And I've even seen it referenced as a safe haven instrument for investments. Guys, gold is barely a safe haven instrument. If you look at indexes for gold prices, it crashed with everything else in 2008. If gold is barely a safe haven, I don't know if there's any argument to support that Bitcoin is a safe haven. I mean, the reason why people even argue that gold is a safe haven is because it's a material. It's something that can be used to create stuff or it's something that's required for, as an input for some things. And Bitcoin doesn't have that. So I don't know where that translation comes from that Bitcoin is like gold. They, they say that because the supply is fixed, it's like gold because it's a finite resource. But that argument is very flawed because that might be the only similarity between the two. If we have a recession, and unemployment goes up, people won't spend their money as much. And that will absolutely impact the, the value of, of Bitcoin. Finally, the last argument, and this one's kind of a sore point for some people, is that Bitcoin is not like past bubbles, or it's not a bubble. Bitcoin has many traits of past bubbles. I won't stand here and make the argument that Bitcoin is a bubble, but there are similarities there that you can't ignore. You know, you think of the tulip bulb crisis, for example. The, tul the tulip bulb crisis happened during the Dutch Golden Age, and it was when a new species of tulip was introduced and people bought it, you know, by the hordes because it was this new thing, this new flower, and this led to that virtuous cycle. As people bought it, it went up in price, so more people bought it, causing it to go up in price, and it continued. It got to the point where a single tulip bulb was being traded for real estate, for a house. The tulip bulb wasn't worth more, people were just saying it could be sold for higher prices. Even the tech bubble of 2000, the dot-com crash, there are so many similarities between the two. You know, this was during when the internet had recently been introduced. It was a new technology, very similar in the way that we're seeing new technology now. People didn't, didn't know what to make of it. People were making the same arguments that you can't understand it. Uh, things are higher in value because of this new technology. And people were investing in any company that had dot-com in its name. In fact, it was a common business practice to change your name and add .com at the end and your stock would see a instant boost in price. Sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? But then once the valuations were challenged, there was this crash and people were wondering, well, how did that happen? Well, it's because a lot of that demand was inflated. It was on the promise of future return uh, without any fundamental backing for, for what was being done. Another common trait between Bitcoin and past bubbles is the fanaticism around it. You know, there's this famous investor, Bernard Barich, who described the markets before the Great Depression. And he's quoted saying, taxi drivers told you what to buy. The shoeshine boy could give you a summary of the day's financial news as he worked with rag and polish. And he goes on describing how everyone seemed to believe themselves an expert on the topic, with this fanaticism ultimately fueling the crash. And we see a lot of that with Bitcoin. People who have never invested before are buying, putting all their money in Bitcoin and trading cryptocurrencies on a daily basis. People who are mechanics, people who are teachers are buying Bitcoin and trading it as if they were full-time investors. You know, people are saying that people are buying Bitcoin because it's the currency of the future, but that's not why people are buying it. People are buying it, or at least a large part of the demand is driven by speculation. I mean, 64% of all Bitcoin has never been used for a transaction and you know, there's this community out there of people who own Bitcoin who kind of cheer each other on for holding on to it and think other people are foolish for not owning it, for not wanting to put their money in it. I'm not, obviously not everyone's like that. There are people, who, very rational people who have their money in Bitcoin, but there is that community out there. And that causes a lot of issues for everyday investors with Bitcoin. Investing should be done from a rational standpoint without emotion. You know, and that cheerleading, it's fueling this fanaticism and irrationality. And again, it's, it causes a problem when you mix that with people making money. People who champion Bitcoin have a lot to gain from convincing you and a lot to lose from you not believing them. So there's this conflict of interest and people go online and they talk about their success story. They say, I bought Bitcoin when it was early. 
I am retiring now with a Ferrari in my dream home. You should do yourself a favor and get into Bitcoin now. But past returns never predict future returns. You shouldn't buy Bitcoin based on what it's done. That's already occurred. And at the end of the day, if you lose money, no one's taking responsibility for that. Think of all the people who bought Bitcoin at $20,000 and where they are today. No one's going to fess up and take responsibility for that. Even though everyone's cheering each other on and telling them to buy Bitcoin and hold on to it, no one's taking responsibility for that. No one's taking responsibility for it. And that's what concerns me. There's all this positive and no one's taking responsibility for the negative. So if you buy Bitcoin, you need to ignore how much it's earned people in the past and look at it from today's standpoint moving forward because that's all that matters. So I'll just do some closing points to kind of wrap up this video. I've talked about Bitcoin, but this argument could apply to some other cryptocurrencies as well. And Bitcoin may keep going up in price. I, I honestly hope it does. I hope it goes up in price and stabilizes so that people can go in and out without any issue. But at the end of the day, Bitcoin is a high risk speculative instrument and it doesn't make for a strong retirement plan, no matter how much others have earned with it. And even though it's gone up quite a bit, that almost makes it riskier. As market value increases, it has farther to fall. And, you know, if that intrinsic value is not there to support it, it could fall all the way to the bottom. And I'll leave you with a quote from Warren Buffett. Be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. And guys, people are pretty greedy about Bitcoin. Just look at the price. Thanks for watching. Leave a comment down below to let me know your thoughts. If you have any counter arguments or whatever it be, I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching, guys.